Oh, yeah. Nice. Uh, great talk. There we are. Thank you, Tim. Right. Uh, thank you very much. Our final talk of this evening is uh, Chris Williams. Uh, Chris, I will make you presenter and look, for, look forward to hearing more. Over, uh, if you'd like to unmute and open up your video, you should have full control. Yes. Hello. Great. Um, yeah, great. Hi, everyone. Hope you can all uh, hear me okay. Um, some fantastic talks today, so I hope mine uh, is all right. Um, my name is Chris Williams. Um, if you need to know more about me, there's my um, Twitter handle and GitHub handle uh, there. By day, I write about uh, enterprise technology for the register, but in, uh, in my personal time, I develop uh, a project called um, Diosix. Um, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about it. Uh, this is, Dios is, is a um, Rust uh, RISC-V hypervisor. Um, I gather you all seem to pretty much know what RISC-V is, which is great. Um, Rust 2, hopefully, as well, because it's uh, it's like a super C, super C++. Um, a, lot of, um, uh, a lot of what I've been working on here has not really been attempted before by anyone, so which I'll, which I'll get to, which is why... Uh, Development has been a bit, um, a bit interesting. Uh, click on the slide. Okay, so um, what is uh, Diosics and why am I doing this? As I said, it's a it's a it's a bare metal hypervisor type one. It is a work in progress. It's not a fully featured um, product yet or uh, or project. Um, there's no underlying operating system, so it doesn't rely on anything like Linux. It's not a KVM based thing. It's 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 literally running on the bare metal all by itself. Um, the goal is to have as a small surface area and footprint, um, so that uh, for security reasons and also uh, to keep it lightweight. Because um, I'd like this to run on as many um, uh, Risk Five uh, cores as possible. Uh, I don't want it, it. It shouldn't have to be tied to the more sort of the high end ones with lots of features. It should be able to run up and down the scale. Um, the small surface area means that um, the the interface between the hypervisor and uh, the guests and the services is quite small. There's not a large API space, and uh, the benefit of that is that there's, there should be fewer bugs, fewer vulnerabilities, um, and it should also keep as much functionality out of the core hypervisor as possible. Um, it's written in Rust. Uh, it is written purely in Rust with a little bit of assembler uh, for the really hardware-specific stuff. Um, the reason why I chose Rust is because uh, I've been writing C and C++, and when Rust came along with all of its memory safety features, the fact it was fast, um, and uh, the fact that it, um, it's, it's good at uh, stopping you from, from uh, suffering from data races and lots of other common types of bugs, I just uh, I jumped on the opportunity. It's, uh, I'm a big fan of Rust. Um, I, like to say that Go, uh, I like to say that Google invented the language of Go, and uh, the folks on Mozilla uh, invented the language of no because you'll get used to hearing that a lot from Rust. Uh, you'll be writing code in Rust and it will at build time warn you that, or it won't even just warn you, it will stop you. It will just stop the compilation. It won't even just warn you. It will, it will tell you that um, you're introducing um, uh, memory safety issues. It has a very strong concept of uh, what's called ownership, which is where um, objects and structures have to be owned by something. Uh, they can't just be left dangling. You can't uh, create it and then put it um, at the end of the list and and just assume that your pointers to it are always valid. Rust won't let you do that. And that's the reason why things like implementing um, linked lists is non-trivial in Rust for a good reason, um, because, you, because you don't want it to be unsafe. And also it affects things like how um, objects are queued uh, in the scheduler and other bits and pieces we'll get to. Uh, it's written primarily for Risk Five, um, but it's not tied to Risk Five. I've tried to, as I'll, I'll explain, I've tried to keep it um, as portable as possible and as abstracted as possible. So, if we want to port it to other open hardware, such as Open Power, possibly ARM, if someone's interested in that, it it will be possible. There's no there's no hard um, dependencies on Risk Five. Um, I chose Risk Five because it felt that ARM and x86 were kind of well worn parts. There's plenty of operating systems out there. There's plenty of hypervisors. Uh, Risk Five felt like a bit like an undiscovered country. Um, the key thing to the, the key thing of this um, is that uh, uh, there are, there are Rust operating systems out there uh, for Risk Five, and there are um, hypervisors um, 
out there for risk five as well but uh, there's no rust risk five provider so this brings together the security features and the memory features of of rust and and the uh, flexibility of risk five and also the, the fact that it's an, it's an undiscovered country there's 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 a lot of opportunity um uh, here um i guess why would you want to use this um uh, for one thing, I just wanted to prove it was possible. It was possible to write a, a, a bare metal, no other operating system involved um, hypervisor in Rust on Risk Five. Um, but also, you might want to use it to run a mix of operating systems on the system. For the kind of applications that Risk Five is going to go into at the moment, it seems there's growing interest in people running a mix of operating systems on a board. So you may have one operating system in its stack of applications that provide the user interface, and then you might have um, another uh, operating system and a, a, a collection of software which does the, the control side of it and does the um, does the, uh, the control side and the hardware interfacing. And so therefore, if you wanted to restart the user uh, user interface side, you don't have to restart the control side. There's, 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 there, I would say there's a growing interest in partitioning hardware, and um, Isaacs will hopefully do that for you. Um, it also lets you develop and test low-level code quite uh, quite rapidly. And um, speaking as someone who develops primarily in QMU because it, it it means you don't have to restart physically the hardware anymore, over and over again. Um, that this um, Dizex should hopefully help you run um, code as close to the metal. Um, and if it crashes, you can just restart it and and debug it um, right there and then on the hardware. It's MIT licensed. Um, I might consider other licenses, but I kept it um, MIT just to kind of just to keep it simple. Okay, so what can it do? It, it does work. Um, it um, when uh, when a uh, Risk Five system is powered, the, there will be some firmware on the board which locates in storage, which could be flash or it could be a connected memory card. Um, it will load um, Diosix and its and its um, and its manifest uh, into memory. And when uh, that happens, Diosix will be given a uh, device tree, which I'll come to in a bit. It will be given a device tree by the firmware. And uh, the device tree will describe um, all the hardware that's available on the host, um, all the peripherals and other resources. It then passes that device, uh, that device tree and then initializes the system in, a, in the way that it wants, so how it organizes physical memory and um, how it organizes the CPUs. Um, it then um, fetches from its which is uh, like a, which I'll come to, which is like a, a, a little a bulk of um, services and guests. It loads those into uh, it, it loads those into capsules. Uh, and capsules is um, on other hypervisors you would probably call them virtual machines, but uh, with um, because Diosix is going for a microkernel like approach, uh, a capsule can contain a system service, which could be something like um, a user interface, or it could be a networking stack, or it could be um, control software for, for storage, and those will run in system services. Those will run inside capsules, which are just as isolated from other capsules, which will be running uh, guest operating systems. So um, I, uh, I want to kind of differentiate the fact that you could have a guest operating system running and have a system service running a capsule until the, the hypervisor, they're all the same thing. So um, it will create these capsules um, from uh, um, all the bits that are loaded with it. Uh, and then it will schedule it. It has a full um, um, pri priority queue based um, preemptive uh, scheduler, multitasking scheduler. Uh, it has um, a Google queue um, so that when new capsules uh, and new virtual cores are created, they go into the global queue and then individual physical cores can uh, take um, the virtual cores off the main uh, global queue and adopt them and um, put them into a, a, their own priority queues and um, if a um, physical core becomes overloaded, it just has too many virtual cores, and there's a rebalancing uh, housekeeper that um, keeps it um, keeps it um, sort of fairly sort of evened out. So there's something uh, for a physical core to do. Um, Dynasix also provides the, the runtime for the system services. So as far as the system services can as a user interface, it is just an application. It st it's started up, it is given a, a a block of memory from which it can start um, allocating uh, heap. It's heap from. It's given a stack. Um, it's uh, um, it has uh, the ability to make system calls down to the hypervisor, and this is all done through uh, a runtime that's provided. Um, alternatively, it can uh, load uh, guest operating systems which are which are in ELF format. So, um, uh, for example, Linux. 
uh, it will pass the ELF format. Also, the system services are, are ELF executables as well. And uh, these are all loaded, as I said, from the file system, which I'll, I'll come to in a bit. The other key thing the hypervisor does is it provides the SBI system call interface, um, which um, uh, SBI stands for Supervisor Binary Interface. Um, the hypervisor runs in what's called in RISC-V machine mode, which has full access to the whole machine. And then um, the guests and the, and the uh, system services all run inside uh, supervisor mode. And then um, they um, will then typically set up a user mode into which run user space um, software. Um, so whenever the uh, a capsule, it could be um, it could be a system service or it could be Linux. Once I need to get anything done, just as a process on on a, on, a, on, a, on another operating system will will call the operating system via a, a syscall interface as a syscall interface, which is a standardized for Risk Five. Um, and it allows you to do things like basic uh, input output. It allows you to um, uh, perform memory fences uh, to enforce memory ordering. The memory fences also have a, a side effects in that they uh, force the, um, the MMU to pick up changes to page tables. So if uh, when Linux um, sets up its paging system and creates its user space, it will call down to the hypervisor to say, can you uh, make sure that the the memory management unit on the on the on the processor core picks it up. It can also uh, do things like um, uh, handle reboots and and shutdowns. So um, if a guest calls the the shutdown system call, um, Dosix will shut down the capsule, um, but won't obviously shut down the whole machine. If you're running Linux on a bare metal board, um, when Linux calls the shutdown um, SBI syscall, it's actually talking to the 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 firmware on the board and the, the firmware on the board will just power the machine off. So it's as far as Linux is concerned, it is it thinks it's talking to um, a, a firmware. It thinks it's talking to just some underlying technology, whereas um, some underlying um, provider. Whereas in this case, Dialysis is that provider, and Dialysis is also um, officially implementation ID five uh, that's registered. Um, so that means that um, when an, an operating system can call down and say, "What's your ID number?" and Dialysis will reply five and the the guest will want will recognize us and that's uh, important because um uh it, it by having an implementation implementation id it reserves some of the api space for us um so that we can implement our own extensions to the sbi so for example we can um do apis that for for user interface and also for communications between system services uh, the other thing that Diosix does, it, it abstracts um, the hardware. So it does have an abstraction layer. It's um, it's it's a crate, which is Rust's um, terminology for a library, which handles all the serial ports, uh, the timers, the RAM, the IRQs, exception handling, all the all the platform specific, all the hardware, the RISC-V specific stuff is is done inside a um, it's done inside the abstraction layer. Um, so if you were to run it, um, as I said, this code, this code is on GitHub, which I'll, I'll get to. But if you were to run it, uh, the command just will just build it. Um, and it will uh, run through the stages of building the software. It will make sure that Rust is uh, configured to be able to build for the target that we're going for, in this case, risc 5 64 gc It will um, uh, then build system services. It will build the, the file system images. It will build the hypervisor. And then it will run it in QMU. That's the default. Um, it will announce that it's found four CPU cores. It's found a gig of RAM. Uh, it shows a welcome banner, which is configurable. It then creates system service GUI, which will eventually be the, the, the user interface. It then finds uh, the guest OS uh, uh, RISC-V uh, RISC Linux 5.4 that I built with build root. It finds that, it passes it, it creates it, produces a capsule for it, creates um, some virtual cores for it. Um, it then makes sure that the physical cores are running. It is a it can support uh, multi-processor systems. It is multi-core multi aware. Um, it then starts the guest. Uh, as you can see, Linux then starts putting it. Linux will then make SBI calls to say, I'd like to write some text. The hypervisor picks that up and says, OK, and runs it out to the, to the, to the output console. Uh, gets all the way down to, um, uh, down to starting init, which will be BusyBox. BusyBox starts to run inside user space. By this point, Linux has been able to set up uh, its own um, paging tables within its its virtualized environment, and there you go. You get to the um, you get to the BusyBox uh, login prompt, which I was I was quite excited to see the first time that appeared. 
So the main, uh, I guess, one of the main things about hypervisors is, is, is isolating all the capsules and keeping them all uh, keeping them all separate, keeping the peace. Um, and uh, other architectures do have instructions and do have functionality which provides this. Um, so uh, I took a look at the uh, the extensions on Risk Five. Risk Five, if um, if, uh, if you're not really aware by now, has a base uh, instruction set, but also comes with lots of extensions. So if you see um, like um, RV32 IM AFDDC, and then you'll know that the, it can support atomic instructions because of the A's there. You know, it can do integer multiplication and divide because M's there. And I saw that there's a hypervisor extension, uh, letter H, and I thought, brilliant, because looking at the specification, it has everything that we need. It has, um, it allows you to define virtualized environments using uh, page tables, just in the same way that you would create a process like the same way that Linux and other operating systems create processes using uh, and, and user space using um, page tables, we can do it exactly the same. And Linux won't know any different, or the op whatever guest operating system you're using won't know any different. It thinks it's on the whole machine. In actual fact, it's running in a virtualized environment. That's it's page tables within page tables. It's um, it's inception, um, which is great, and it's all defined, um, but it's not ratified. And it's still in development. They're at version 0.6.1 the last time I looked. And when you get to version one, it's considered approved its role by the Risk V community. There's nothing stopping someone designing a chip right now which supports the H extension as it stands. But given the fact that this is going to have to be quite a standardized and it's quite complicated um, for good reason, it's it's a, a complex it's a complex uh, feature. Um, I would imagine that a lot of silicon vendors are going to wait until it gets to version one before they start on it. So silicon is some way off. Um, and it also needs to mature as well because um, it is, it, you will kind of want to avoid any errata on that one. So uh, I can't use, I can't really use H right now. And also um, because it's an extension, it might well not be available on every single core. And again, I'd like to support as many cores as possible. So I went back to the specification. Inside the specification, I found uh, a feature called physical memory protection, PMP. And this is available, from what I can tell, on pretty much on, on quite a lot of um, silicon already out there. Um, it's available on lots of open cores, and it's also, it's also emulated by um, QEMU as well. And physical memory protection allows you to define a region of physical RAM in which supervisor and user-level code can run. And and on where it can't run, and and how it can run. So you there are a set of control registers which allow you to define whether you can read, write, and execute in that in that region. There's another set of registers which allow you to define the start and the end of end address of each region. Um, and these control registers are per are per CPU core. So if you have eight, if you have like say uh, four cores inside um, inside your system on chip, each of those cores will have uh, the registers to the, each support up to eight regions. So you could, in theory, have um, uh, you can hopefully you can see where we're going with, with this. You can use this to basically pigeon in and and contain um, each of the guests within these um, within these within these PMP regions. Uh, the hypervisor still retains control as a, as a machine mode. So, so no matter what whichever regions you create and say um, and say supervisor software can run in this region. The hypervisor can still have full control of the machine, and crucially, this this uh, still works with virtual to physical memory addresses. So when uh, operating systems like uh, Linux and FreeBSD um, set up their uh, user space and their kernel space and uh, divide that up using page tables, um, just as they normally would, um, then uh, if those page table, if, if a virtual resolves to a physical address that's outside the PMP region that the guest is supposed to be running in, then it triggers an exception that the hypervisor can pick up and deal with, um, which could be killing it, or it could be um, determining if there needs to be if there needs to be some demand loading of memory. Um, but either way, the, the hypervisor can can detect when uh, a guest steps out of its um, PMP region and stop it. Um, and then that also applies even if you're doing user space and kernel space inside there, which is extremely useful. Um, so hopefully that makes sense, but I also just do a quick illustration to show what this looks like. Um, you would have a configuration register, which um, 
which uh, in this case, we've decided to go with read, write, execute. It it's, it's perfectly possible to load in a kernel or a system service and say, this section is um, readable and executable only. This section is read and writable, but not executable. So you have those sort of level of security protections. Um, at the moment, uh, when Linux starts, um, it expects all of its memory to be read, writable, and executable. So, and the name, I guess, one of the name of the games of this is to be able to load guests without any modification. I don't want to have to start doing customized Linux builds and free BSD builds and other builds of software. I should be able to, and I have done, you just go to build root and you can build a generic RISC-V Linux kernel and run it, uh, just run the binary straight away off the hypervisor, um, which is perfect. It minimizes, um, minimizes the work involved. Um, so in this case, you program uh, the registers to say read, write, execute. Uh, it's, uh, we put it into a, a mode called top of range, um, or as the specification calls it, TOR, but I've called it top here. And you set the end address and the start address. And the, uh, when um, the guest um, A is shown run, um, those registers are programmed. Um, the virtual core that's inside the guest is run on a physical core and the physical core uh, enforces those uh, those boundaries. So if it goes outside those boundaries, it sets off a uh, sets off a um, exception. And then uh, when it comes to run a virtual core in uh, another capsule, um, uh, it, when guest A's had enough time running, it's interrupted by the preemptive scheduler. Uh, the uh, the uh, virtual core for a system services loaded onto the physical core. There's the, the contact of all the registers are changed over, and then. The PMP is programmed for it, and then the system service starts to run. And as far as the system service is concerned, it has always been running, um, and it is running in its in its own um, it's running in its own uh, space where really it's been shared with um, with all the other guests and system services. For this to work, it's going to require a device tree. And device trees actually needed at two levels. The device trees allow for the automatic discovery of hardware. And it's a specification, an open specification that was um, defined by IBM, I'm pretty sure, for, for power systems and has been adopted by ARM and you know, lucky enough is, is prevalent in Risk Five. The device tree is a is a tree which describes the devices and other resources that are present in the system. Uh, it tells you where the memory is located, it tells you where the peripherals are. It tells you where the IOQ routing is. Um, it allows you to set boot parameters. It tells you about the CPU cores. It's 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 um, it's it's everything you need. And uh, the key thing is that when it tells you where a peripheral or a peripheral is located in memory, it also tells you the type as well. So, um, and uh, the idea is that I don't have to produce a port or special software that's tied to a particular um, board. Um, so, a case in point, I was. Uh, I initially did a lot of the primary um, development in QEMU, and QEMU provides a device tree to the hypervisor that says you'll find a serial controller at the standard national semiconductor one at this particular address. And uh, Dialysix detects that and talks to that serial controller on that address. But then when I switch to Sci5, um, the device trees are provided by the Sci5 hardware. Um, Sci5 puts its controllers, it's national semiconductor compatible controllers somewhere else in the memory map, but yet Dialysix will still be able to detect it and handle it without a, a single line of extra code. So I was pretty happy about that. It's just me working on this at the moment. So any kind of reduction in work is uh, is, is great. Um, there are Rust device tree parsers out there, but I could not find a generator, like a code that actually generates parse uh, device trees in Rust. Um, so I had to write my own, which um, was interesting. So I got to know the spec quite well. The reason why I needed to be able to generate device trees as well as um, as well as read them is because the device trees are also passed on to the capsules to describe their virtual environments. So this allows things like Linux and FreeBSD and um, and uh, also the the system services runtime will pass these um, device trees that they're given and um, will follow them. So the the great thing about Linux is that you can tell Linux that it's at um, a particular physical address and it has this amount of RAM and Linux will pass the um, uh, device tree internally and uh, just merrily go on its way and working. So uh, it's not tied to any particular physical address um, on RISC-V um, because it's just as flexible as, as the hypervisor is. So device trees work up and uh, basically one of the main forms of communication back because firmware gives the hypervisor a big device tree describing all the available resources 
Then DialsX uh, creates its own smaller versions of the device tree that describe each of the individual environments that capsules run and then passes those device trees to the capsules. And then inside the capsule, you would have something like Linux, which will pass it and understand what its uh, virtualized environment looks like and set up its um, set it up. Or it could be the runtime in the system service, which then turn, which then uses that to then um, turn the capsule into a, a traditional looking application environment. So the device tree is not tied to risk five um, and it's all on, it's on GitHub if anyone would like to use it. Um, I'm not, again, I'm not aware of anything that creates device trees as well as system for Rust. So if you're writing Rust and you would like to use a Rust device tree, it's nice and memory safe. The, all the memory safety is in there as well. So you won't get tripped up by any corrupt um, device trees. And also it's been tested with real world uh, device trees as well. Um, to tie this all together, um, there's a chicken and egg situation where um, uh, the hypervisor wants to keep as much of its system services outside of its core, um, and yet it's going to need some of its system services to load the system services from storage. So, um, because I'd like to put things like file systems and storage controllers inside these um, supervisor level services, keep them out of the machine load hypervisor. Um, so I devised a, a manifest file system. Um, manifest is maybe not the great best word for it because manifest ex exists elsewhere in the Rust world, cargo primarily, which is the main build control system. But anyway, it's called the manifest file system and um, um, it can contain um, uh, guest operating system images, system service executables. It can contain welcome messages if you need to display a banner for, for reasons. And there's flexibility for more as, I, as I'll come to. Um, I felt that using CPIO, for example, style approach would be a bit overkill. Um, and uh, this, and also it's, that's more geared towards a traditional file system, whereas I wanted a manifest file system, which allows me to have greater control over particular components. This is loaded into RAM with the hypervisor by firmware. So this will typically be stored in flash, or it could be in a micro SD card that's plugged into the side of the board. Uh, and then the hypervisor will then unpack it during startup. Um, and as it unpacks it, it runs through the instructions that are in there. So for example, here's a system service. Okay, then start it as a system services as a guest. Don't start it until it's been started by the user or start it automatically. Um, uh, it's generated by uh, a make DMFS tool that I made and it's, that's configurable via a, um, by a TOML file. So the idea is if you wanted to produce a customized um, build of, of dial six with your own collection of um, and your own collection of system services for a particular application, um, for a particular device, uh, you can. You don't have to dig into the code. It's 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 configurable using a, a, a human readable configuration file. And I thought this would be preferable to hard linking guest binary to the hypervisor. It started because I didn't really want to hard link a GPL um, Linux binary to my MIT licensed um, hypervisor. But also it got to the point where I wanted to load multiple system services and multiple guests. And at that point it just, it became a lot more logical to use a file system approach for that. Um, Rust uh, provides a tool called Cargo, which is um, pretty awesome for managing dependencies and compilations. So Rust, uh, I use Cargo for building all of the Rust code, but Cargo is not designed to build assembly code or do anything outside of building Rust. So it needs a bit of help. And Cargo provides something called build scripts or build the RS scripts. And they're not strictly scripts. They are Rust programs that are, that are they're programs of their own right. They are compiled on a host, on the, on the build system host and uh, run prior to any Rust compilation. So it allows you to set up the environment um, for, your, for your Rust build. And in this case, um, my build RS script got um, uh, complicated, well, got non-trivial enough and also was needed by the system services as well as the, the hypervisor um, that I decided to split off into a separate project. Um, and uh, Mason is, uh, will uh, assemble um, uh, machine code that you give it, assembly code that you give it, um, and then prepares that for linking so that when Cargo comes to build the main Rust code, it will be able to find the um, platform specific um, uh, platform specific code and link it in. And also the services runtime uses it as well. It's configurable again by a TOML file. So you can use that to control where the assembly files need to be loaded. So if you create an open power port, you don't have to dig around in the code in the main core code um, to, to do this. You would create 
a new platform create platform dash open power and um, you would put your platform specific code into there use the same interface um, between the platform code and the core hypervisor and then just add your power uh, your open power um, assembly files to the to the um, to the configuration file so that when you select to build for open power it will just automatically find all these resources for you the, the idea is to make it as automatic as possible um, Rust has improved its inline assembly a lot while I've been writing this. And so building assembly code separate to cargo may not be needed in future, but um, I'll take a look at it. Um, it may be that some of the assembly code is brought back into, into, in, into Rust combined. Um, and all of this is wrapped up in a, in a just um, make file environment, just as brilliant for simplifying um, the building. So of uh, of this project so it brings together mason make dmfs and cargo all together um what next um there's still uh, lots of bits and pieces to do um there's the user interface to finish off so that you can control the host and its guests um that i also would like to get networking and storage access running next as services so that um if the um, so what will happen is that for example Linux will talk to the hypervisor via say um, vertio and say I'd like to open a storage block device and then the hypervisor will just route those messages to the registered um, service that handles storage which will then um, uh, talk uh, to the um, to whatever storage hardware they can find the um, the API for that I still need to work on but um, that'll be the general sort of approach to that um, it also be nice to get um, uh, some sort of automation in there as well, um, because this isn't really far off running um, things as just containers, but in a slightly different sort of environment. Um, I have plans for DMFS because I'd like to secure it. I'd like there to be signatures so that when you're loading something, it hasn't been tampered with. Um, and uh, also the possibility to encrypt it as well, which can be decrypted. Um, the, the securing of the DM, uh, DMFS will also require um, uh, a sort of changes we also require um, sort of features in the firmware as well because the firmware um, has to be able to um, do a signature check on 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 everything it's loading from say flash or memory card otherwise you just don't have the the, the root of trust you don't have the chain of trust in there and there's also uh, i'd like to support the um page extension as well at some point and um and run more than just linux uh, I was, i'm pretty close to getting freebsd running in there and that'll be pretty exciting as well uh, but uh, it'd be good to keep, it's good to have the PMP base in there because it means it's going to run on a wider selection of silicon. And um, when we then come to supporting the H extension, uh, um, yeah, there are efficiencies in using the H extension in that uh, with the H extension, you can do it, doing things like demand loading of extra memory is um, a lot easier with PMP. You have to extend, you can extend a memory region, but then, um, uh, you know, um, uh, Linux will just simply see that as you plug in extra RAM sticks into the machine. So how that is dealt with will have to be, um, it's going to have to be um, thought about. And um, that's it. Um, thanks a lot. Uh, that's my introduction to um, to where the project stands at the moment. The some documentation is uh, GitHub and it's available through docs.org. Um, all the code um, that uh, I talked about today is in a development branch called uh, November Reorg, but by the end of today or by the end of the week, that should be merged into into the into the main um, into the main branch, so everyone can um, can just fetch from there. Thanks a lot, Chris. Thank you very much. Very interesting talk, um, and great to um, hear this work. I see you've already got a question from Sil. Did you get this to work on silicon? Um, I wish I did. I have a high five. I have, no, I have a um, sci-fi, um, the sci-fi um, unleashed, which was their first board that they did, um, which is sitting over there. But I have not had a, a chance to boot it on there yet. Um, mainly because, um, mainly because uh, it will involve writing to an SD card and then plugging the SD card in and seeing if it works and. Um, uh, and taken out and I uh, haven't got around to that stage yet of doing that level of, of running but hopefully soon I mean the hardware's there and I need to use it so yeah soon very soon hopefully okay. uh, 
any more questions either type them in the chat or just open up your channel and um talk okay but but thank you very much indeed chris 